My talk is about uh, how to turn trauma into personal growth. And even though the book, my book that is out there is translated in a very different meaning, it's really all about growth and gift after trauma. So we'll, I'll take you to a journey in this, hopefully in this conversation and also in the workshop later tonight, we can talk more about it. So I just wanted to start by saying that the picture that you see here, the waterfall is uh, my, the place where I was born in Venezuela. That's the largest waterfall in the world. It's a beautiful place. So I'm from Venezuela. Then I lived in New York. That's a picture of, I don't know, Times Square. Uh, and um, then right now I'm living in Miami. And one of, why am I saying this? Because ever since I was a little girl, I kept, um, I grew up in a community full of immigrants and refugees. And one of the things that I was seeing I was very curious when I was little, and I kept thinking, like, how people do one thing, how people do another. And one of the things that I kept seeing is people in, around me in my community that have gone through difficulties, um, some people were able to overcome their difficulties. Some people were able, were, like, more stuck in their suffering, they stay like in their moment, they couldn't, able, they, they couldn't really heal. And there were a third group of people that, that not only they overcame it and they did better, but they actually thrived. They were doing really, really well. And I kept asking myself, how is that possible? How are people that have gone through all kinds of like persecutions, war, refugee, immigration issues, poverty, and they actually, come out of life and they not only do well, but they like life, they appreciate life, they enjoy it, they do things for themselves, for others. So that was a question that kept coming to my, to my, you know, I, I kept thinking about it. And as I was studying psychology, that was also my line of research and like, wow, really, what makes a difference? What is it that makes a difference? Is it personality? Is it the background? What, what, what takes people to choose one way or another? Or is it something that comes automatically? Or how is it you know, that's, that the, there's such a big difference? You know, two people can be in the same situation. Some people do one way and other people do another. And I want to tell you, this is a picture of my grandparents. And believe it or not, my grandparents are from Transylvania. Yes, yes. And actually, my mother is here also. She was born in Oradia, so it's such an amazing thing for me to be here. And, you know, they were... So I'm very, very connected to this land, even though I, I've only been here twice. And uh, I, part of what my question came from my grandparents. And my grandparents, you know, were, went through a lot of difficulty um, in their life. War, as I said, persecution, communism, um, having to leave their, their home with nothing, having to start life again many times. And really, I learned so much from them. And it was such an interesting way in which, you know, my grandmother was lovely, beautiful, brilliant, inspiring. And she had a hard time throughout her life. And she somehow stayed stuck with some of the things that were you know, painful for her. My grandfather, on the other hand, also went through such difficulties, the same. And somehow, he was able to have a life that was not only like enjoying and connecting with others, he also traveled the world with my grandmother, he wanted to go places, he helped a lot of people. So I was like, wow, that's interesting. So this is a, a, something that has been carried with me, that has taken me to this place of like, what is trauma? What, is, what happens after trauma? How do we heal trauma? Because this is what I call trauma. And I know the word trauma, sometimes people say, Ayadid, please don't talk about trauma. The word trauma is so difficult. It's so hard to talk about that. And I know it's true in, uh, in, the, st in the United States, people sometimes have bad associations with that. And I wanna say, uh, trauma is associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? You guys know PTSD. Trauma is associated with all the symptoms that in the medical field that, you know, that we are learned. And I'm here to share with you an, a different 
concept and a different perspective on trauma and a way to expand this notion to see if we can go further and if we can understand it better because there's something behind trauma that I want, besides trauma that I want to teach you. So what is trauma? The way that I, that I talk about trauma is in this way. Trauma is anything that shakes, that shatters your belief system about yourself or about another person or about the world. Trauma is anything that shatters your values, your beliefs about yourself, about others, and about the world, for which you have no resources and no coping mechanisms or no tools to face. You have no way of dealing with it. So for example, if you, um, if you lose a loved one, at that moment, your life is shaken, you don't believe that this happened to you, and you, at that moment, you don't have the, the tools to deal with it. For example, if you get divorced, uh, your belief system about relationships, you thought, oh, no, getting married is for life, and here I am getting divorced. So there's a, a way of like that your innocence or your understanding about life gets shaken. And you're like, okay, so then what, is, what are relationships? Who am I? How do I believe in other people? Where is the trust? For example, when we go through the pandemic, I don't know, I mean, I heard these days from some people how the pandemic was here, but the belief system that, oh, um, there's no such thing as viruses or illnesses that are global, or if there are, we trust the government or the science to take care of it. So it shattered our belief system of who we are, what we do, that we are not able to move places, that we have to stay home, like all these things, and then what do we do with that? So there are many different reactions to it, right? So some people reacted by being paralyzed, the way that David was talking about. Some people reacted by being more feisty, more angry. Some people reacted by being more uh, dissociated, disconnected, like pretending that nothing's going on. Everybody had a trauma response. And when I talk about trauma, I talk about big T trauma, like war, like loss, like death, like, you know, this huge... Uh, difficult moments, but I also talk about little t traumas. Little t traumas are things that happen to us every day, and I want you to start paying attention maybe to things that have happened in your life that you might not have called trauma, and I'm asking you to see if there's something there that, for example, when you were in school, when you were in, uh, in kindergarten, or when you were in uh, first grade, second grade, and your friends didn't invite you to their birthday parties, or you were bullied, or you were discriminated against, or you lived in a home that your parents were not exactly uh, the most nurturing, welcoming, or you know, loving parents. And these are things that we don't necessarily call trauma because it's not something that happens once, like a lot, like a death, like a war, like, but it's something that happens over time that it's chronic. And sometimes it's microaggressions. Sometimes it's like little things that we don't realize. When I first moved from Venezuela to the United States, believe it or not, I had an accent. I still have an accent. And uh, people were, uh, the, the first time when I moved to Boston, I was, I was 17 and then I went back to Venezuela and then I moved back again when I was 22, 23. And people in Boston would not sell me things. I needed a lamp and I needed, you know, some, some things for my home, and they're like, no, we don't, tr we don't know if you can, ha you can afford it, if you can, that we can trust you, we're not gonna sell you things. Why? Oh, because you're not from here, you don't speak English well, you don't, so these are little microaggressions that after a while I'm like, wow, this is traumatic, this is not easy to sit with this. So that's why I'm saying like, you know, there might be big things, but there might be little things. So trauma has, Three major, oh, and by the way, it's not just individual trauma. I want you to think about trauma also in a collective way. What does that mean? Collective means that it's not just what happens to me as an individual, it's also what happens to me in the culture that I live in, in the society. It also happens to my community, to my country. So, um, 
I'm sure you have examples of collective trauma that, that have happened in Cluj and have happened in Romania and that have happened in Europe and that have happened in your own community where you grew up. And these are things that are also traumatic experiences that are not just lived by one person, but it's a shared experience. And one of the things that I talk, the way that I talk about trauma, it has three major uh, characteristics. The first one is that trauma is subjective. What do I mean by that? That every person or every community that experiences trauma um, experiences that because they feel it, because they decide, I know that I'm traumatized or I know that I'm suffering. I know that I'm going through a difficult moment. Who am I to say what you're going through? So for example, if for me, getting divorced was not trauma traumatizing at all, let's say, okay, I was able to get divorced in a very amicable way, everything was fine, we, we did everything in a, you know, very consciously, but my friend who went through a divorce too was destroyed and was extremely affected by it. Or, you know, who am I to say that divorce is traumatic or not? Or, uh, you know, I uh, went through, I moved countries. And for me, maybe it was very difficult to move to, a con to another country, but for the next person, it was not. Or maybe, it's, you know, I went, you know, some people have uh, an illness that they say, okay, I can, it's manageable. For other people, it's the most traumatic thing that ever happened to them. So trauma is subjective. So we are, are the ones that can tell what is traumatic for us and what is not. The second thing that happens is that trauma is relational. The way that I understand trauma is that trauma doesn't just happen in the world. It's not like the thing that happens. It's that trauma is what happens to us that affects the relationships that we have with ourselves, with, other, with others, with the world. So for example, if something happens to me, that um, it's, it's a difficult thing that, that happened. It's not just the event, it's how the people around me react. It's how people are supporting or not supporting. Do I have somebody to talk to about it? Is it making me more ashamed, like David was saying, or more isolated? And is it, does that make me uh, make big distance from the people around me? So it really affects the relationships around me. Trauma is relational in every possible way. It's not like uh, one of my colleagues, Gabor Mate, I think, you know, he's Hungarian. He talks about trauma. Um, and the way he says is that trauma is not the event, but what happens inside of you about, about that, that traumatic event. So it's not just, it's not the event itself, it's how you feel, how people around you react, is what happens in the relationships around you. So trauma is relational, and guess what? The healing of trauma, and we're, I'm going to talk more about that, is relational too. Trauma is healed in relationships. And the third thing that I want to say is that trauma is contagious. And what does that mean? That means that trauma is affecting not just us. I see it more like imagine a vertical, a vertical line and a horizontal line. When we are suffering, when we're going through something, and we're walking around life, and we're relating to our family, to our children, to our parents, to our, par to our partners, to our coworkers, and we're carrying that, uh, that pain. It's almost like an open wound. The, the way that we relate to others is gonna come from that trauma response. And it's gonna come from that place of like, ah, you know, this bothered me, or I'm triggered by this, or I'm, I don't have enough compassion for you, or I'm not empathic. That's one way of responding of people around us, right? And this is a, it's coming from a trauma place. It might not be that that's who I am, but if I'm suffering in the moment, if I'm not have, have not resolved that issue, if I'm not conscious of what's happening to me, I'm gonna spread this like a virus. So trauma is contagious at this level, at this horizontal level. But guess what? Trauma is contagious at the vertical level. What does, that, what does that mean? That means that everything that happens to me and everything that I don't allow to be conscious and aware and I don't process, I pass it on to my children and my grandchildren and to my descendants. And in the same way, I inherit that. 
I get, I get that from my ancestors as well. This is a big concept, and this concept is something that I talk a lot about, and it's the intergenerational transmission of trauma. So imagine how important it is for us sitting here, and of course, all of us here are the one conscious beings that are wanting to work on ourselves, that are on this journey, and that's, that's so beautiful to see. I mean, it's really amazing the, in the talks that I've been hearing in these two days, all this information about taking responsibility, about being conscious, about really owning and working on who we are that we, cannot, we, we can no longer afford to be in life just like wandering around clueless, right, on, on, cell, on automatic pilot, just reacting to everybody and responding to everybody without knowing where is that coming from. That, because the price of that is very high. The price of that is war. The price of that is bad leadership. The price of that is more suffering in the world. And who here wants less suffering in the world, more peace in the world, more, more, more of a conscious world? Please raise your hand. I want to see. Yes. So we're here to, to do something different, right? To change the world in some way, to contribute to the world in a way that, that makes sense. So when we are the ones that are carrying a lot of the trauma, not, maybe not from our lives, but from things that have happened with our ancestors, right? We heard Christina yesterday. Uh, the ones that you are here talking about a transgenerational inheritance. It's that concept. And it's how do we know what we carry and how do we know what to do with it so we don't pass it along. And let me tell you something about that. The way that we carry this is not just um, our experiences, but the way that we carry that is in our DNA. So we carry that in our bodies because trauma gets expressed in our bodies, as we, we also talk in these two days, right? We feel it in our bodies. We carry it in our bodies. The body keeps the score. The body remembers. And even if we don't, we don't remember here and we're not aware here and we, don't act, we cannot access those memories here, our bodies remember. And a lot of that is genetic as well. So in the same way that we get that information from our parents and grandparents and our ancestors, and this can be not only individual experiences, but also cultural experiences, in the same way we also, we also get all the treasures and all the gifts and all the beautiful wisdom that gets passed on from our ancestors and we pass it on to our descendants. The, the thing is, how do we decide what do we pass on? How do we decide how to shift that, how to deal with that, and how we manage that? So if there's a cycle of trauma that gets repeated from generation to generation, we are the ones that stop it. So if in my family there's this belief that men are abusive and men are dangerous and men are not to be trusted, that's information that it's not just my experience in this lifetime, but it's the information that I carry in my genes. And somehow it's going to be manifested in my relationships today, right? How am I relating to the partner that I choose? How am I relating to the relationship? Do I trust the person that I'm with? What do I do with it? And, and that kind of thing we need to really pay attention to and think about. You know, there's an example of a, I had a patient that was terrified of water, terrified. And when we explore more, there was some history of drowning, of like death that had to do, you know, they were drowned in the ocean. But this, it came from generation to generation, which she was not even able to get in the shower sometimes because of how f the fear of water that she had. And it was something about exploring the relationship with this that might not even make sense. One of the things that I tell people, how do I identify when there's trauma? When you have an overly disproportionate reaction to what's happening to you. You know that word trigger, like an activator? When you walk around, I had a little girl, I was working with a 10-year-old, and she, every time she passed by a coffee shop, like Starbucks and all the stuff back in the day in New York, she would get all, like, she would have a panic attack and she would have anxiety. And when we really look into that, we started to see that her father was abusing her, and her father loved coffee, and he kept drinking coffee, so he had coffee breath. 
And she kept associating the smell of coffee with the abuse. But right, right that requires something to pause, to understand, to, to make that connection. So what do we do? What do we have to do in order to stop this cycle of trauma? So I have good news for you and something that made me really excited when I was writing about this and doing research about this and finding this out. And it's something called epigenetics. Has anybody heard of epigenetics? Oh, wow. I'm impressed. This is great. This is not, it's not, I'm asking because it's not such an old concept. It's a newer concept. And it gave me so much hope. Epigenetics is the capacity that our genes have to express or not express their information. So depending on the experiences that we have in our life, we're able to express that information in the genes or not. So imagine how amazing it is that we are not just doomed by whatever we carry with our genetic information or whatever happens to us in our traumatic experience, but we have the capacity to modify, to change, to shift that information once we become aware, once we're conscious of it. So how incredible to be empowered, not only you know, from a behavioral perspective, but also from a, from a genetic perspective. So something to look into, please you know, read more about epigenetics, and this is something to think about, to say, it's not, okay, I'm, you know, we don't lo no longer have the excuse to say, well, I come from a family of alcoholics, That's, that means that I'm an alcoholic, it's in my genes, I can't help it, I'm going to be an alcoholic too, and probably my children are going to be alcoholics. Guess what? We don't have that excuse anymore, because we know that whatever we do it, with our own experiences and the way that we relate to that can change the information and can make that not happen and not manifest in our life and even change information genetically for our descendants. So the big concept that I want to share with you today. Who here has heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? Everybody, right? Our medical world, like Misha, right, like it has been very, very good at focusing on the negative symptoms of, uh, of our health, right? We all know that, you know, all the triggers and all the, you know, we get shaken, we have flashbacks, we have nightmares, we hyperventilate, we sweat. We all know what PTSD. Who knows what PTG is? Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm, I want to bring here a message of hope. PTG is post-traumatic growth. And actually, that should be in the cover of my book. I don't know why they didn't put it in the book. And the, my book actually is called The Unexpected Gift of Trauma, not The Bad Consequences of Trauma. It's The Unexpected Gift of Trauma because it's about, all about the growth that can happen after living traumatic experiences, the growth that can happen after suffering, after adversity, that transformation, that transcendence that we, go, we can go through. And we all have the capacity and the potential to go through that. And knowing that this is a possibility, I think it's the most hopeful and the most illuminating thing to know and to have. It's like there's light at the end of the tunnel. So what is post-traumatic growth? Post-traumatic growth is all the positive consequences that can come as a result of a traumatic experience. So it's all these things that happen that are positive, all the things that, and you've seen examples today of people that have gone through difficulty and they change that, they shift that into something very positive. And I wanna say this is not necessarily just resilience. Resilience, which is a word that has been very much in fashion in the last few years, Resilience is our capacity to bounce back. And it's wonderful, and it's great to have resilience, and it's when we have all these tools and these coping mechanisms to deal with suffering, with adversity, and I love it that we have resilience. But I want to invite you to do something more than that. It's not just bouncing back, but it's bouncing forward. It's actually taking it a step further. It's almost having a quantum leap into the growth it's really transcending your suffering. It's taking the adversity, the pain, the suffering as an opportunity for growth, as a trampoline to get to something bigger and higher that you would have never thought you could get to. And 
I want to tell you all about post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is a springboard for transformation. It gives us hope. It's, it's a real possibility. And I, I, there are five stages that I'm going to tell you how to get there. And these five stages, when you come to my, whomever comes to my workshop tonight, I hope a lot of you can make it, I'm going to go deeper into these five stages and we can actually leave it and see how, we, how that plays out. This, this post-traumatic growth is something that once we know is a possibility, we know that we can get through it. Um, I had a, a, a couple that came during the pandemic and um, the wife called me, she was super anxious and super affected because she said, Edith, this is the end of the world. I don't know what I'm gonna do. My life is over. I live here with my husband, my four children, and I, I'm done. And I said, what happened? I found out, you know, since we're trapped in this house for the last three months, I opened my phone, my husband's phone, and I saw that he's been cheating on me over and over and over and over for a few years. I'm done, my life is over, I thought we were in love, I thought marriage was forever, I thought this is the end. Um, I said, okay, come. And then as we were working with her and her husband as a couple into this very, very traumatic experience of infidelity for them, that, that's how they defined it and what they experienced. And they did such a diligent job in like being focused into working on it they were able to come to the other side after, after a, a year of work, um, completely transformed. And the way they talk about their, their marriage, even their, chi their children came to my office, were like, what did you do to my parents? They're like two different people. And I, they, the way they talk about their, their, their relationship, it's not that it's perfect, no relationship is perfect, but the way they talk about it, it's like, we got to know each other better, we know what we want, we know who we are, we have an amazing communication, we have tools to resolve this. We took our relationship to the next level. I have another example of, um, I don't know if you remember in Miami, there was a building that collapsed out of the blue. Did you ever hear about that news? Also, it was in 2022, 2021. It was like a building that was very well known and it just collapsed out of nowhere and like 100 people died. And I was working with those 100, 100 people and their family, I mean, not the people that died, but their families. And they were, they, they were very affected. They were children, grandparents, uh, husbands, wives, the all, you know, all, whole families. And some of these people, after a year working with them or a, or a couple of years working with them, first they were, they, of course, they went through the grieving process, but after they were able to work with it, not all of them, but a few of them, that were, um, that would tell me, you know, I would have never wished this on anybody, this loss and this pain, but I would not have changed this for anything in the world. And this sentence I keep hearing over and over. I was in New York when the, when the, uh, the, the buildings were, um, what's it called? The, the, yeah, the 9-11 when the buildings fell, and I was there, and I was working with the Red Cross and, and working with the, a lot of the refugees and the families and some immigrants that were there left. And I heard that again, at, at that time, too. And every time I work with Cambodian refugees, I work with uh, Latin American refugees, Im immigrants and refugees, and they said, I would not wish this on anybody for nothing in the world, but what happened to me, I would not change for anything. Why? Because it made me the person that I am today. Wow, every time I hear that, I cry. I cry. Because to say something like that, it's so powerful. I, there's this woman in my community that uh, lost a son. He was biking in the street and he got hit by a car and, and died. And she worked this out in a way that it turned it into an amazing movement to help other people grieve and to help other people transform. After she worked through her grieving and after she worked through her loss, she grew in such a way that she's made it into like a whole community event. She has put kids together. She's helped teenagers become more conscious and more have b better values. Like it's incredible to see that. 
And I'm like, wow, every time I work with this, the strength that I see people get, the, the strength that I see people get and the appreciation of life. So I'm gonna tell you, oops. I'm going to tell you the five stages quickly because we only have a few more minutes. And I, wanted, I want you to like, think about if you can please choose something that makes you feel uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be your biggest trauma, please, no. But, uh, or if you want to, yes. But choose something, maybe think about something that makes you feel uncomfortable that it's still there. People ask me, okay, I mean, this whole post-traumatic growth sounds great, I love it, the light at the end of the tunnel, we all want to be transformed, but how do you do this? How do we do this? How do we, how do we stop uh, an addictive behavior? How do we stop suffering all the time? How do we stop repeating things over and over and not getting out of it? How do we deal with issues that, you know, that are keep us making us feel bad and we, we can't change. How do we do that? Does anybody have an idea? <laughs> and I'll hear, I'll hear from you in the questions. But this is the, the, the five things, five stages that I think are very helpful that I've seen my patients over and over after 25 years. And the first step is the most difficult and the most important. And the first step is radical acceptance. What does that mean? That means that for some, so when you get to that point when you no longer can take it, when you get to the point when the pain of go, doing the same thing over and over and over again is too much, when you get to that place of saying, I'm done with like, doing things the same way, or my life is not the way that I am, or I feel stuck where I am, or I'm really the suffering, it's not, I can, I can have a better life, or I can have better relationships, or I, I sh you know, I'm not doing well with myself, or I'm not doing well with others. When you get to that point, you say, okay, what do I do? There's a moment there that requires pause. It's really pausing and looking at yourself in the mirror, pretty much, and saying, what am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What is it? Let me put a name to what I'm doing. Let me identify the thing that is hurting me, that is bothering me, that is making me feel suffer. And that requires a lot, a, a really radical honesty. Be radically honest with yourself. Like no more excuses, no more dissociations, no more disconnection, no more paralysis, no more pretending that it's something else. It's like, how do I look at myself and say, what's really going on with me? Okay, yes, it's true. I am addicted to this, to social media. Or yes, I am depressed. Or yes, I am, I am uh, I'm anxious that, you know, that I cannot function anymore so because I have so much anxiety or I don't really want to live this life any longer so this moment of like stopping and saying what's happening to me and putting a name to it it requires a lot of courage I think you heard David say that before me it really or the Shaolin I think was saying that it's it, it requires courage to look at yourself and say this is what this is who I am this is what's going on with me but once you do that, once you recognize and accept that this is happening, begins the process of healing. This is the moment when healing begins. And then we take, you, we take through a few other stages. The second stage is the stage of safety and protection. This is when we reach out to others and say, hey, this is what's happening to me, but I cannot do it alone. Remember I told you that trauma gets healed in relationships? This is how we heal. We don't do it alone. We cannot do it alone. We have to reach out. And I'm not necessarily saying we reach out to psychologists, although I recommend it for everybody, but we can reach out to our f family, to our friends, to our community, to our yoga teacher, to our spiritual leader, to, you know, to a retreat. Go to a place, go to a person that can actually validate what's happening to you, that can actually recognize, accept, and validate without judging, without criticizing, because that moment of actually expressing and saying how you feel and talking about what's happening to you, it's crucial for the healing. And then we, it takes us to this, you know, validating conf difficult conversations that can then move us into the third stage of new narratives. When you get to that place and say, okay, so 
my belief system didn't work anymore, the way that I saw life doesn't, it doesn't mean I didn't have the resources to deal with it, what do I do? I move, let's, let me open up to new possibilities. Let's see what else is there. Let me see how I can change things, how I can try new ways of thinking, new paradigms, new uh, beliefs. Let me uh, go out there, try new friends, and this is how we create new stories, new narratives for ourselves. Then we get into integrating. This is the fourth stage of all of it. We integrate all of it. And then we get to the fifth stage, which is wisdom and growth. And this is the stage when people usually are very appreciative of life. They have new perspectives. Not only that, but a lot of people, when they get to this stage, they find a sense of purpose. They have a sense of meaning in their lives. They wake up in the morning and say, I know why I'm here, I know why I woke up, I know why I'm living this life, and this is my purpose. I have a mission. Usually people that have taken to this stage are able to transform the very wound that happened and make it into the wisdom. It's like the wisdom is in the wound, from the breakdown to the breakthrough. It takes from the pain, they turn it into purpose. We have so many examples like that every day. We, we saw it here in these two days. Mostly every person that is doing something back to the community, it comes from a place of pain. Originally, it comes from a place of wound that has been transformed. Look at yourself also. Have you processed that? Have you changed that suffering into something meaningful into, in, for yourself and to back into the community? It's a, it's a beautiful process to see. It's like the example of the butterfly that gets to be you know, that, that caterpillar gets to be destroyed, truly destroyed before it becomes a butterfly. And it's almost like a little bit, like dying a little bit before being reborn. And it's very scary and it sounds very painful. And when you go through it, what happens on the other side is beautiful beyond belief. And the way I talk about this is not just individually. And I think that's why I, my invitation is really for us not to think only about ourselves as individuals, but as ourselves as a collective. What do we need for us as a community to heal those collective wounds that we have? How do we heal you know, the wounds of war? How do we heal the wounds of communism? How do we heal the wounds, the wounds of abuse? Or the wounds of, you know, you know, that we have in each community, you know, we have our own story. How do we heal that in order to get this more meaningful, more purposeful life together as well, as a collective, you know, that can take us to a different level to, of relationship, that can take us to a different level of wisdom. Um, I, and there, there are things that we, that we do in order to keep this going. And for me, you know, I'm gonna finish with saying, music, art, dancing, movement is fundamental and essential to our well-being into our lives and integrating these things. It's not just about the head, it's not just about the thinking, it's about how we put it in our bodies, how we share it in community, how we add all these elements of art and music and movement, to meditation, breathing, of course, to make it, to really make a difference. Bless you, my dear. <laughs> and really, and, you know, and, and taking it seriously. I mean, take ser music serious, take dancing, singing, you know, con and, 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 and the, the most important thing is belonging, connecting with, oops, with, connecting with the others and having a sense of belonging and cultivating relationships with music, with art, with movement, with talking, with sharing. So I'm gonna leave you with that. Thank you so, so much. <laughs>